Aquane. I'm Stacy Klein, founder and artistic director of Double Edge, and I have the honor to introduce the third in the living presence of our history series presented by Okiteo, an indigenous cultural center, and co-presented by Double Edge. The Okiteo Council's co-directors, Rhonda Anderson and Larry Spotted Crow Mann, have generously decided not only to develop and create their own much needed cultural and multi-tribal Western mass focused practices and cultural space, but also to share beyond their own people this educational series so that our communities can learn about the long unacknowledged history of the Nipmuc Nation and the other tribal presences among us. The first in the Living Presence series delved into the reality of these tribes today, their presence and the relationship to their millennia long history of presence. What became clear as Larry and Rhonda shared stories of their upbringing and their children's upbringing was how essential it is for allies of the indigenous community to support their voices and acknowledge the extreme challenges facing their community to living a just and acknowledge fully realized cultural life. The second in the series was subtitled Mascots, Logos, Imagery, and Cultural Appropriation. The genocide and resettlement may appear to many as things of the past, but it has become known to us and the second panel made that very clear that a history of colonial disappearance of an entire people has a clear and horrifying imprint in today's racist stereotyping in state seals, flags, school mascots, and other misleading imagery that only hold a false supremacist mirror to native youth and to all who are subjected to being forced into an image not of their own making. I think that's important to reiterate that we all want our image to be of our own making. For this reason, Double Edge is devoting space, resources, and time to the autonomous um, place in which native voices will be determinant and the final word on their own identity. The third in the Living Presence series uh, relates to this topic of determination. It's called Healing and Reparations Through the Land Back Movement. It directly addresses the subject of the essential space and land. Um, I'd like to introduce the people of Okiteo who are making this happen. Uh, actually, first, I want to thank the people who have funded these this programming and um, also other programs at Okiteo that are um, of a different nature. Thanks to the National Endowment for the Arts, the New England Foundation for the Arts, the Mass Humanities, and HowlRound, who is um, making this series and also recording it. So you can go back if you have missed the first two um, and um, hear that forever. Kuta um, Badamish to Andre. Strong Bear Heart Gaines, Okiteo's first artist in resident, who is reinfusing this land with traditional practice and sharing the Nipmuc language to be heard again. So, and also teaching people in double edge generously that language. The co-directors of Okiteo. Rhonda Anderson is a Nupiak Atabascan from Alaska. Her native enrollment village is Kaktovik. Her life work, most importantly, is as a mother, a classically trained herbalist, silversmith, and activist. She works as an educator activist on the removal of mascots, water protector, indigenous identity, and protecting her traditional homelands in the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge from extractive industry. 
Rhonda curated Vital, Vibrant, Visible, Indigenous Identity Through Portraiture, an ongoing collection and exhibit of portraits of Native peoples of New England to bring awareness to contemporary Indigenous identity. She's also the curator of the Living Presence of Our History series and will be the, is the moderator, um, incredible moderator today. Rhonda is also commissioner to Indian Affairs in Western Massachusetts, a founding member and co-director of the Okito Cultural Council and the Native Youth Empowerment Foundation, as well as a representative of the Native movement. We have worked really hard on Okiteo this year during COVID, um, incredibly hard, but all of that was going on while Rhonda has been working tirelessly in the state house and every other place to um, rid our community of the disaster of mascots and other things. Um, Larry Spotted Crow Man is a citizen of the Nipmuc tribe of Massachusetts. He is a nationally acclaimed award-winning writer, poet, and cultural educator, traditional storyteller, tribal drummer, dancer, and motivational speaker involving youth sobriety, cultural and environmental awareness. Larry's books, including Morning Becomes Thanksgiving and The Whispering Basket are available online. He has been a board member of the Nipmuc Cultural Preservation, is on the review committee at the Native American Poets Project and travels throughout the United States, Canada and parts of Europe, not since COVID started, um, to schools, colleges, powwows and other organizations sharing the music, culture and history of Nipmuc people and lectures on Native American sovereignty and identity. Larry is co-director of the Okiteo Council and the Native Youth Empowerment Foundation. And um, Larry has also been working tirelessly um, answering the calls of people who have finally realized that they need to call um, the Native community's voices um, all over, including Harvard, Jacob Spillow, and um, too many to count. Larry, thank you. Bye, Nitam. Niwa Chia Yim, no hog Nanawak. Wu Nasha no Tumu Manatu. The Batni. Wutu Chikindisin, Okumis. The Batni Wuchi Sabasu. Wusuka Tia Huna, notas Ninua Manantio. King Nuta Yu and Daminuk. And the male Ninua Mequantam Kicha, Ka Mata Wananta, Ka Nagutie Kokuta Ninua, Manatu, Usuka Tia Huna, Womaneta Tio, Ka Nosoka Muso Amoke, Nino Hok and Ganto Chokesic. Yayo, I greet you in the language of my ancestors. I greet you in the words of peace and reciprocity. And though, although is, there is no exact translation in the English language, I ask that our ancestors would come and share this space with us. And that when we share our breath, we are sharing our spirit, we are sharing our honesty, our integrity, and that we ask that we have this exchange, this conversation in a good way, that we would both leave in a better place after that. And um, <clears throat> thank you, Stacy, by the way. And it's always very important that we open up and, and ground ourselves in that important aspect of language, culture, and identity. And I know that um, we're about to have a very serious conversation about land back. And uh, this is really a really important time. And I'm really excited to be here with all of you today. And, um, uh, and there's no better way to start that off and reminding people the language of the land, the language of that land and what it spoke back to the people and what it's still speaking to the people. And I believe, it, and I believe it's speaking to all of us now. And it's the reason why we're gathered here today. And so with that, in this time of crisis and turmoil, whether it's the pandemic or racial tensions and the continuation of, uh, of, of the inequity that we're all experiencing. I wanna offer this um, Nipmuc healing song. And I, um, I pray that it comes to you in a good way and it helps you out on whatever journey you're going through as we, as we uh, take on this journey today together. <clears throat>
Legacy, um, Katovic Mea Woranga, Herbanks Mea Anaya Noranga, Pangmapap Anua Uranga Korinami. Anupakshanaga Alak, Tanakshanaga Rhonda Anderson, Akaga Peg, Akaga California Mea Gorok, Apaga Chris, Apaga Herbanks Mea Gorok, Akaluga Olive, Akaluga Katovic Mea Gorok, Apaluga Johnny, Apaluga Nom Mea Gorok. Shabak Tunga Western Massachusetts Commissioner on Indian Affairs me, and Shabak Tunga uh, Co-Director of Okateo Cultural Center me. So welcome and good afternoon. Thank you for being here on such a beautiful day. Oh, it's so gorgeous outside. I'm so sorry that we're not outside. <laughs> and to the panelists, I'm so sorry. <laughs> um, my name is Rhonda Anderson. I am Anupak Athabaskan from Alaska, and I just greeted you in my traditional language. Um, I have lived most of my life here in Western Massachusetts. I grew up in Plainfield. I went to school at the beloved old Sanderson Academy <laughs> right down the street. Um, and I choose to live here in Western Massachusetts. And the land that I am privileged um, to steward and live on is in Colerain. And it's the traditional homelands of Sokoki Abenaki and Pakumtuk on the Pakamagan watershed, which is known as the Green River today. Um, so welcome officially to the living presence of our history, part three, the healing and reparations through land back movement. This is a conversation on indigenous land tenure, stewardship and access. Um, the topic was identified um, as a necessary conversation this fall when we featured um, Dr. Just Cree in traditional indigenous medicine. Um, this forum is a continuation of necessary conversations with indigenous community members and allies regarding issues that we face today as native people. Um, the panel will delve into the importance of the land back movement, the dispossession, colonization and lack of access to traditional lands that have caused generations of harm and the recent awareness of rematriation through the land back movement. It's gaining traction. Um, before I continue, I'd like to recognize this land that I'm a guest on and this land that we're all benefiting from is Wabanaki Confederacy territory. Wabanaki means the place where the sun is born every day, making the people of this territory people of the Dawnland. Tribes historically local to this area would be Sokoki Abenaki, Pakumtuk, Nipmuc, Nanatuk, and Mohican tribes. Sokoki means the people who go their own way, and Sokoki are still here, and they are a state recognized tribe in southern Vermont. Pakumtuk is a Mohican Pakumtuk word that would translate roughly to people of a narrow swift river or people of a swift clear stream. And Pakumtuk were absorbed into their kin of Mohican, Abenaki, and Nipmuc peoples. Nipmuc means people of the fresh water. And of course, they're still here. They're a state recognized tribe in Massachusetts with a small reservation of land that the Nipmuc has never ceded or been out of uh, tribal hands. Nanatuk means the oxbow part of the Quinnitoqua River. And local tribes also absorb the Nanatuk. Uh, Mohican uh, translates to people of the waters that are never still, and it's referencing the Hudson River. War, genocide and dispossession and colonization that pressed the Nanatuk and Pakumtuk um, to seek refuge with their neighboring kin also pushed the Mohican, Stockbridge and Muncie bands west um, in the late 1700s through 1800s to Wisconsin, where they have a reservation today on Menominee territory. Um, the Mohican tribe does maintain tribal ties to this area and they have um, an office in Williamstown and they have land in Troy, New York um, to maintain their local ties. We are in the watershed of the Quinnitaqua River or Connecticut River. Quinnitaqua means long tidal river. And while this river has known several names by many different groups of people along its flowing path, Quinnitaqua has stuck. So it's important to remember that while indigenous communities have lived, gathered, farmed, hunted, and fished in the area for thousands of years, they're still here. So please get to know the indigenous people of your area and ask what you can do to lift and raise their voices and honor and respect their sovereignty. And in that spirit, I have three action items. First, recognize and make changes to the dominant narrative 
that glorifies colonization and genocide of indigenous peoples of this area. Be mindful that problematic terms like Pioneer Valley are a reminder of a legacy of dispossession, removal, and subsequent erasure. Second, please consider supporting any one of the Native organizations that are here today. So I, I will post um, after this event, I'll post a list of the organizations and a reading list after the event. Lastly, there are five bills in the State House that five tribes of Massachusetts support that address removing racist mascots from public schools, changing Columbus Day to Indigenous Peoples Day, <laughs> respecting cultural heritage, creating appropriate educational curriculum in our schools on Massachusetts tribes, and to create a permanent commission to ensure the education of Native youth in the state. So please contact your legislator through maindigenousagenda.org and encourage them to co-sponsor and support these bills. So thank you for listening. I am now super honored um, to be able to introduce our incredible panel members that are sitting inside on such a gorgeous day. <laughs> So, um, and hopefully we'll hear a little, bit, a little bit from each individual as I'm introducing. First, I'm very honored to introduce Ramona Peters. She's chairwoman and acting treasurer of Native Land Conservancy. Ramona is a Bear Clan member of the Mashpee Wampanoag tribe and lives in Mashpee on Cape Cod, Massachusetts. Ramona has recently worked for Mashpee Wampanoag tribe as a tribal historic preservation officer and NAGPRA um, Native American Graves um, and uh, Protection and Repatriation Act uh, director. Um, her work focuses on repatriation, indigenous rights, historic and cultural preservation, and many other endeavors of the Wampanoag. She also serves her tribes in a variety of capacities, including as a traditional chief's counselor and a member of the Mashpee Wampanoag Women's Medicine Society. She's the sole proprietor of Peter's Wampanoag Consulting Company, assisting other tribes, universities, museums, and archeological service companies, historic preservation agencies, authors, and community development organizations. Ramona has a master's degree in applied human and community development from the California School of Professional Psychology and a bachelor's degree in education from the University of Arizona. Ramona is also a well-known ceramicist of traditional Wampanoag pottery. So Ramona, I've heard or, or read actually that you have used the term resistor and that the work of a resistor is to carry on the culture, that they're born to do this work chosen by creation. So you have two minutes or less to tell me why you choose or maybe have been chosen to do this work. Are you a resistor? I am a resistor. Good I would have you. to say, yes, I am a resistor, um, determined to hold on to all the cultural traditions that I can possibly bring forward and continue. Um, I used to teach um, Indian education, as they call it, <laughs> in our school system to Native children here in Mashpee. And it was one of my absolute favorite jobs um, to, to see um, how, well, it just picks everyone up. Uh, and it helps us when we face this world as it is. Our values are still very different. Uh, we really need each other in our culture to sustain ourselves through the um, anti-earth and anti-native culture uh there's so many uh values that are lost in, in capitalist society that um our people are just never going to well i shouldn't say never but hopefully our people um stay uh, resistors as well uh, to adopting things that are really against the earth uh, concepts are looking at the earth as a resource rather than um, a loving being that um, that respects and honors and holds us as cherished loving beings as well. Um, our mother, 
So yeah, I um, I hope I believe we're all resistors in some ways, um, holding on to treasures that um, support humanity and all living things. Excellent. I'm so proud to know that you are a fellow resistor. Resist on. <laughs> um, is Fred, Fred is on? Fred Freeman, chair and founding member of Nipmuc Cultural Preservation, um, is a former board member of Nipmuc Tribal Acknowledgement Project. Fred has been an integral key to obtaining land in the Quabbin um, Nichiwag bioregion of Petersham that will allow the Nipmuc Nation to have a place for teaching, interacting with greater community, and provide a space for tribal members to heal. Looking towards the future, Nipmuc Cultural Preservation will construct an environmentally friendly cultural ed and education center um, to teach and represent the aesthetics of Nipmuc culture on this land. So Fred, in two minutes or less, yeah. how did you come to do this work? Did you have like a strong role model in your life to instill the importance of education and tribal culture? Well, uh, for the most part, can you hear me? <clears throat> yes. Okay, great. <laughs> well, for the most part, uh, really, it's something that's been a part of me uh, since I was very young. And of course, uh, my relatives here in the area uh, spoke a lot about it. And one of the challenges was that uh, being in a city environment, uh, we weren't able to be exposed to all these uh, native things that, that really we should be able to be exposed to. And I really hungered for that. Uh, you know, time went on, and of course, uh, there was a push for federal recognition, which ended in some bitter disappointment. Uh, and it was uh, decided at that time that something should be put together uh, so that we could uh, pursue this dream of, of having land and a place to uh, do the things that traditionally we should know how to do. Um, I got together with David Paul Pine White, who has since passed. Uh, many of you may know him. Uh, and there was a meeting held back in 2013 at the Worcester Public Library in which uh, a group of us uh, community members got together and uh, decided that, that we needed to have an organization that would uh, pursue these goals. Um, I was asked at that meeting to, to chair this group. Uh, I accepted to do that, and uh, since then we have been able to acquire uh, approximately uh, 68 acres of land uh, within central Massachusetts with 20 or so acres of land being in uh, the uh, Petersham, uh, town of Petersham, uh, Nishawag, which is the native uh, uh, term for the town, uh, and also uh, to acquire other lands in uh, Nakwag. Uh, which is the uh, region uh, that Hubbardston, Massachusetts is part of, as well as Rutland and uh, uh, Oakham and a few other towns. Um, so we've been pursuing that and uh, been uh, very happy to uh, be able to share that with our NIPMA community. We're in the process, of course, of, uh, of uh, looking to see uh, what those lands can be used for ultimately. Uh, and that's that. Thank you. Thank you for joining us mm -hmm. today. Um, next is Kristen Wyman. Uh, Kristen Wyman of Eastern Woodland Rematriation. She's a Nipmuc and an advocate for tribal self-determination and revitalizing indigenous foodways and economies. For over 15 years, Kristen has worked as a consultant with nonprofit organizations, tribal governments, and state and federal agencies, including Native Land Conservancy, Nipmuc Indian Development Corporation, Mashpee Wampanoag Natural Resources Department and Education Department, Mass Department of Public Health, National Park Services, and in the University of Massachusetts at Boston. She has initiated several women and youth-led programs in areas of environmental justice, violence and substance abuse pr prevention, youth development, food sovereignty, and transformative leadership and nonprofit development. <coughs> Kristen's fight for the right to land, food, medicine, and human dignity is completely tied to her identity and responsibility as a Nipmuc woman, mother, and daughter. She is co-organizer of Eastern Woodlands Rematriation, 
a network of indigenous women in two spirits, restoring the foundation of sustainable food systems. Her work is deeply personal and motiva motivated by the important roles of women as landholders, farmers, culture bearers, artisans, and diplomats. As the global movements program manager with Why, Why Hunger, Kristen supports social movement processes at a global level in their path towards food sovereignty and liberation. Kristen is a graduate of UMass Amherst with a degree in legal studies, political science, and Native American studies. She completed her Master of Science program in environmental conservation from the University of New Hampshire. So Kristen, two minutes or less, can you share when you started to see how it was your responsibility and fight for your identity and rights to land, food, and medicine? Yes. Um, well, I guess I am a resistor. I didn't know, um, but uh, it took me, I guess, maybe returning in some fashion to um, the Connecticut River Valley where I was a student at UMass Amherst. Um, strangely, it took that experience for me to really understand what it meant to be a Nipmuc uh, daughter. My grandmother is a traditional leader. My ancestors are um, from the Eastern part of Nipmuc territory. Um, I'm a descendant of the Thomas Speen clan. So I grew up right off of Speen Street in Natick and didn't realize that um, those were the names of my ancestors and the original proprietors that would do, um, that would later do the land grant deal with John Elliott to establish the missionary town, the praying town of Natick. Um, it was my time at UMass Amherst being surrounded by Native community. I believe that just kind of um, helped me understand, you know, that uh, being born into this kinship there bears a responsibility. Um, and so I think that's really where the fight in me sort of evolved. Um, but I, I totally understand that uh, my ancestors and creator had it laid out for me before I was even born. Um, and oftentimes I'll be told that I'm, I'm very political. <laughs> and I often explain there's really no way um, when we think about all of the odds that are stacked against us in our survival. Um, not just the war, not just the colonialism, but the, the surviving of the pandemics um, and the displacement and the removal. Uh, you know, there's really no other choice. Um, so, you know, we share the space with a lot of folks that come into it from this altruistic understanding and knowing that we have a responsibility to be good relatives and good ancestors. And for many of us Native people, I know I'm not alone with this. It's just, it's really not a choice. And um, we do the best we can to continue that trajectory of um, what Ramona was saying and carrying it forward and knowing that uh, we have a role in today's time to continue the fight and the resistance. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for everything you do. Next is Stephanie Morningstar. Stephanie is Mohawk, Oneida, and of mixed European descent. She is an herbalist, soil and seed steward, scholar, student, and earth worker dedicated to decolonizing and liberating minds, hearts, and land, one plant, person, ecosystem, and non-human being at a time. Stephanie is the executive director and Resource Relationships and Reciprocity Co-Director of Northeast Farmer of Color Land Trust, an organization dedicated to advancing land access for indigenous, black, Latinx, Asian, and other land stewards of color. Stephanie grows medicine and food with her community at Sky World Apothecary and Farm and teaches about the wonders of plant medicines at Seed, Soil, and Spirit School. Stephanie's theory of change is rooted in community-driven, self-determined solutions created by BIPOC communities for BIPOC communities. She carries with her an over a decade of, of indigenous community-driven systems of change in healthcare, legal, herbal, agricultural, land access, and academic research spaces, spaces where she cut her teeth on speaking truth to power. Her work advancing sovereignty in institutional spaces with and for indigenous communities has resulted in mandating indigenous cultural safety training to service providers, indigenous dispute transformation frameworks, and meaningful and ethical indigenous driven research in climate change. So Stephanie, two minutes or less, 
Can you share what gave you that spark to speak truth to power and begin your work of decolonization? Oh, Sego, Sego, Grego. Um, thank you so much for having me. Um, what gave me that spark? Um, what gave me that spark was the experience of being indigenous in the system. Um, what gave me the spark was, um, if you were talking about the origin story of where I come from and in this work would be the death of my mother. Um, it's not a fun story to share, but I will share that my mother was the inheritor of um, a great deal of intergenerational trauma that uh, led to something called white coat syndrome, which is a fear of going into Western hospital or um, healthcare spaces. And um, I later found out after um, her tragic death that um, the word in Ganegeha for hospital in Mohawk is, um, it translates to that place you will never come out of or the place that you go to die. Um, that catalyzed something inside of me. I was already an herbalist. I was already working with plants and the land, but it was something that really catalyzed this, um, being able to see the um, crystalline structure of settler colonialism throughout all of our systems and interwoven um, through all of our lives and how that informed um, the way that we participate in um, our own ways of being, doing, and knowing, our own healthcare, our own, um, our own ways of staying in right relationship with each other. Um, I noticed that um, we were carrying a great deal of pain and anger and suffering and had begun to either, um, I identify that pain as something that we can probably see as an, um, an autoimmune disorder. We started, it's, it's eating away at ourselves, um, whether it be through things like um, intergenerational trauma, the, the symptoms of, um, like I mentioned, white coat syndrome, lateral violence, um, all these different things. So I decided to jump into trying to make a change in systems, which is what I, started doing. <laughs> um, so um, through that, I really started looking at land and um, something that Glenn Coulthard said um, back just a few years ago really struck me and it really started um, breathing life into why I do what I do now. Um, he said, for indigenous nations to live, capitalism must die. And for capitalism to die, we must actively participate in the construction of indigenous alternatives to it. So here we are constructing an indigenous alternatives to the capitalistic framework that has not only um, hurt all of our people, but it's also hurt our relatives, the lands, the waters, the non-human beings who make a life on those lands and waters. So uh, that's why I do what I do. That's why I'm here. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Um, next is my good friend, Jess, Dr. Jess Dolan who is an ethnobotanist, anthropologist, and indigenous studies scholar. She has sought to support indigenous sovereignty through environmental and food systems projects through her work in Canada and the United States since 2007. She contributes to decolonizing uh, public education in Native American and indigenous histories by participating in community-based projects, giving talks on ethics and methods of cross-cultural research curriculum and library collections curation and teaching. Her doctoral dis dissertation explored the Haudenosaunee philosophies upon which the Haudenosaunee Environmental Task Force was founded and to contribute to building an understanding of indigenous environmental governance and caretaking. In addition to her new role, congratulations, as ethnobotanist for the Akwesasne Environmental Division, she is part of the biocultural research stream of the Conservation Through Reconciliation Partnership and the Landscape of Nations 360 Indigenous Mapping Project. So Dr. Dolan, when did you begin your, I don't know, recognizing your lifelong love for plants and how did you make that connection to indigenous philosophies? Um, hello everyone. Can you hear me? I'm a little awkward with microphones. Um, thank you for having me today. And uh, I grew up in Brattleboro, Vermont, which is Sokoki Abenaki homeland. And um, I think 
um, my education of plants mostly came from uh, being outside a lot, growing up playing outside on the rivers and in the forests. And, and in terms of um, Native American and indigenous studies, this is an interesting question to start with. <laughs> Um, I would say that Southern Vermont and possibly Western Massachusetts when I was growing up was full of a lot of um, sort of romantic stereotypes about Native histories and peoples. And I definitely heard and learned those and um, absorbed them. And I was, um, it, it planted a seed in me, a burning desire to learn the truth and to actually um, learn what I wasn't being taught. Um, and, you know, I, I had questions that a lot of people had and probably still have, like, um, what were Native communities like before settlers arrived in, in North America? Um, what were their technologies and sciences and their ceremonies and their ways, their relationships with the land and each other? And um, so I started out, I wanted to, um, to learn about that, but I think it would be appropriate to share that I went to this ethnobiology conference in 2003 before I started on my journey and I met a wonderful indigenous ethnobotanist named Enrique Salmon. And he said to me, he advised me, if you want to learn about our people, you should probably go back first and learn from your people. So before I started my, my uh, big journey into Native American and indigenous studies, I went to Ireland and I studied traditional medicine in Ireland. Um, and that's when I got my master's. And then, then I came back and I um, ended up going and doing my PhD at McGill University in Montreal. Um, and I learned primarily from the Haudenosaunee. And um, that's why I still work with them today. And I'm still learning from them today, but I ended up moving home a few years ago. And so I'm here now. Thank you. <laughs> And last but certainly not least is Peter Forbes of First Light. Peter's life work is about the courageous convening of people across differences of race, class, and ideology to resolve matters of consequence to their shared future. Peter works directly with communities and organizations that aspire to evolve, become more inclusive and equitable. Peter is the co-founder of First Light, an ambitious effort between 65 organizations in Maine and the Wabanaki people to increase their presence and sovereignty on the land. He is co-leading similar efforts between conservation organizations and indigenous nations in Alaska, Oregon, and California. So Peter, I know that you have a gorgeous and absolutely beautiful farm in Vermont, Knoll Farm. Has this farm been an inspiration for the work that you do? Thank you, Rhonda. Um, of course it has. And uh, I would say most um, coming to understand the history of it that I did not know. Uh, I am um, I'm not proud uh, of the fact that until maybe five years ago, I could tell you the names of every Western settler on our farm but could not tell you the name of the Abenaki family who Rufus Barrett most certainly displaced. Um, it has given me the courage to be on this panel with all of you, uh, which is a great, great honor. Um, I am, uh, it is an honor because these voices are so important. And Larry, I wanna thank you for that very, very powerful prayer and, and healing to us. Uh, my own voice is that of a, of a white man. I am not an indigenous person. I don't represent indigenous people. I'm a very privileged white man working within the conservation movement to transform that movement because I believe it has a far, far greater promise. I think um, understanding more the history of the land that I steward, the history that had been hidden to me, understanding that more has made me realize that the sacrifices made by Black, Brown, and Indigenous people are part of, are part of what made me. 
and certainly a very, very big part of what made the conservation movement. And uh, I want to make amends. And I think that the conservation movement is mature enough now to know that it also wants to make amends. Um, Finally, I'd say I think to live here in this country, in this moment, and to try to be whole requires some level, some very big level of cultural reconciliation, and land conservation has a role to play in that. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, I would like to go back to the land acknowledgement. So this is the first, you know, I gave the land acknowledgement in the beginning, right? So this is the first step in recognizing that anywhere you are on Turtle Island, you are on indigenous land. And understanding that dispossession, war, and genocide gave that end result that allows you to benefit. So, and I hope that you heard in that land acknowledgement how tribal names are often place-based and understanding how indigenous tribes, peoples, and nations, we see ourselves as coming from the land, a part of the land, and identify as such. Indigenous people have practiced the concept of sharing and managing resources on a living land since time immemorial. The concept of owning land, being separate from the land, and extracting resources for capitalism is a European colonizer concept. So in working together today, I hope that we're creating intersectional relationships and an understanding of the systems of power and inequity. There will be topics like colonization, racism, white supremacy, dismantling white power, and privileged systems. All these terms might make the non-Indigenous listener feel uncomfortable, so please, Please listen, check where that energy is coming from, where that discomfort begins, feel those emotions and, and understand where, that, where those fears might come into play whenever you're feeling defensive and learn how to sit with and use that energy for a greater good. So the, the, the term itself, land back, really can strike fear into non-natives. I mean, think about it. If we acknowledge that this land was inhabited and cared for by indigenous people for thousands of years, stolen through hundreds of years of, of intentional genocide, slavery, war, forced dispossession, does this mean native people are coming for our land? Land back has many meanings. It can mean disrupting the power of white supremacy and continued colonization. It can mean understanding that colonization is not a historical term. It is an ongoing and intentional process that continues today. Land back can mean allowing access to public lands for traditional pursuits, such as cultural and spiritual ceremonies and the gathering of medicines. Land back can mean returning the land to a tribal stewardship and governance. Land back can mean creating reciprocity with the earth by implementing traditional environmental knowledge and allowing to, the earth to live in her natural state. Land back can mean simply raising funds to help support these efforts. And yes, land back can literally mean returning land to indigenous people who are forcibly removed and forcibly dispossessed from the land. But the first step to begin this process is relationship building, building lasting and reciprocal relationships. We must first listen and center indigenous voices from this area. And since there are so many ways to define land back, I would ask our indigenous panelists to define what land back means to them. So first I'm going to ask Kristen, what land back means to you as an individual, as a tribal citizen, and what is the meaning of rematriate? I'm on the spot. Okay, um, I think I might just share an image. Um, yeah, I'll share an image. Um, so Eastern Woodlands rematriation, and I'm just gonna stop with this one image. It's a beautiful collage by my sister, Nia Holly Nipmuc. 
Um, Eastern Women's Rematriation is really a collective, as Rhonda mentioned, of Indigenous two, two queer, two spirit, um, sorry, Indigenous queer, two spirit, uh, femme folks, and families of uh, Wabanaki and Southern New England tribal communities. And um, as mentioned, when we're talking about like the, the kind of Western dominance colonial mindset of being disconnected from the land and having this power over. Um, we're really in this process of rematriation and returning to kind of the earth-centered, femme-centered matriarchal, which many of our cosmovisions and creation stories originate from this feminine matriarchal understanding. And one thing we're really particular about in explaining rematriation is that it's not to um, is not to become or or uh, or replace patriarchy. It's really to challenge this ideology of dominance of power and control. And Remetri is really returning to a way that's focused on on life, on on rebirth, on regeneration of human and non-human relationships. And so, um, Eastern Woodland Rematriation is really wholesome in our thinking. I think all of our panelists kind of spoke to all of the reasons why it's in existence. We're really trying our best to transition beyond this capitalistic structure of, of domination, of, of patriarchy, of a focus on, um, on control over and kind of a focus on death, it seems. I mean, we know that that is ultimately what capitalism is doing to all of our natural systems. Um, and we've been in this journey for over 400 to 500 years, even before that, if we think about the extraction of our, of our homelands even before settlement. And, um, and now we're in this process of healing. And what I really appreciate about rematriation is that we're all in this together. So it is, it is native and non-natives rethinking our relationships because we all have been you know I'm sitting here speaking English which is the language of our colonizers I'm not speaking in my traditional language I think our languages um, and our cosmovisions are probably the strongest uh, tools that we have to really understand these old relationships and an old way of doing things and so um, I'm just really excited to contribute to this conversation of land back because as Rhonda mentioned, there all, are all of these other ways. And depending on the community in Eastern Woodlands Rematriation that's thinking about this, I mean, we're not a nonprofit. I don't think we ever will be. We are literally a collective of people trying to remodel and embrace and embody a different way of doing things. And so we really respect the autonomy of the different tribal communities that comprise the collective. So the collective has never held land. Um, we really maybe create a container for the facilitation of these different relationships. And um, I know I can speak for myself personally that I'm, um, you know, we're in this path of just wanting to, ask, you know, center it from the perspective of the land. Um, so even in that respect, having necessarily a land trust or another model that might mirror um, some of these structures that have been harmful of putting kind of a permanent placeholder. We know that that is a tool that is accessible and um, support the exploration of that tool and what that might look like. But we're also just literally trying to reestablish relationship even with non-human kin. So that means centering ourselves with with our medicinals, with our, our four-legged, with our river systems, and just um, creating access and starting to facilitate that remembering and that belonging that's been severed for, for many reasons. Um, so I'll just stop there. Uh, oh, thank you for sharing. Um, I once heard um, Jesse Little Doe Baird say, that in Wampanoag, I lost my land comes out as I fall down. And the early Wampanoag always had at least one foot on the ground and to fall down then was to literally fall off your feet, have no ground beneath you. So when your land is being taken from you, you fall down. So Ramona, I wanna ask, does that resonate with you? Do you feel that 
Um, and so you and your community are upright and standing with both feet on the ground, firmly planted when you, um, when you participate in land back, like what does the land back movement mean to you? Well, I, I feel like we're still standing, um, first off. Uh, I understand what Jesse's trying to say in a dramatic way, um, but we are um, still very well planted here, standing on two feet, um, not feeling so good, but um, we're together and managing. Uh, what it means to me uh, is it's, um, you know, growing up here, we had 22,000 acres to roam around and uh, three rivers and three major ponds, freshwater ponds, and, and also uh, four bays, um, saltwater bays in which we, growing up here, um, the town was run by native people right up until 1975. Um, my mother was a town accountant, I'm grandparents on the board of assessors and selectmen and women the whole police force, everything, fire department, we're all native people. We took care of this land in our town, in our tribe, and it's one thing. Since then, we have been pushed out of the town hall. We have um, lost our rights to the land. We tried to recover it through a suit. Some of you may remember. Um, I grew up with listening to elders talk about the loss of land. And it, the land itself is where our culture comes from. It's, um, it's important to feed ourselves through it and uh, be nourished by it. Uh, so creating the Native Land Conservancy was just um, doing what I heard needed to be done. Um, it's an attempt to create a container to hold the land that, that people are ready to give back to us as a people. Um, it's an all native board of directors so that um, it really has more meaning as a coming back to us. Um, although there's several different tribes are members of our board, it's not just Mashby. Um, right now, um, that means um, we understand that all tribes need um, nourishment by the earth. Um, we wanna provide space for that. Uh, the native life ways of what um, our land will represent or give um, access to, so people, um, it also is a way for the colonizers to um, make restitution. Uh, some are ready to do that. And it's been a long time. We've had exercised as Native people a tremendous amount of patience um, with the colonizers to uh, do the right thing. And I, I do feel it is the right thing to give uh, land back, especially that they're not using or even if that they've abused and we will work towards restoring it. Um, it's really uh, necessary now and here we are in, in climate crisis. Um, and people are looking towards us to provide answers to that. I actually have mixed feelings about the <laughs> response. Uh, I can remember being in a medicine circle many years ago in the 80s, maybe. And uh, there was an elder from Nova Scotia, uh, Henry Knockwood was his name. He came to me as one of the elders to speak to us um, about prophecies. And he said, this day was come when the white man would stick his hand out and ask us to shake it in friendship again. And, um, and he pulled his hand back and he said, don't do it. <laughs> he said, we, we were also surprised, you know, of his response. And it's like, uh, 
And I've had, I think about that now because it's happening. We have, I have you know, dozens of emails and all kinds of requests to lead the charge for uh, how, how we're going to respond to this climate crisis. And I, you know, I guess I want to say, as long as like, people don't betray the earth again and betray indigenous people, then I would say we could help. But I don't know that we can really get a commitment of non-betrayal. Uh, anyway, that's a thought. Um, I'm sorry, I strayed away from the question. Uh, no, don't no. ever apologize. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for sharing. Um, Stephanie, I would like to know um, what your definition of land back is. What does that look like to you? Thanks for asking. <clears throat> um, so land back is, it sounds like a pretty simple idea, but when we start to compl um, complicate it with feelings and relationships, it becomes very complex. Um, in the work that I do and the collective spaces that I discuss and agree on what land back is, um, we represent land back as a stepping back, a making space and a decentering of settler colonial desires, governances and dysfunctional relationships that attempt to control creation instead of recognizing that we are a part of creation. In fact, we are known as the younger brothers of creation. We are dependent on the rest of our family for existence. Um, land back is a recognition of settler colonial positionality as occupiers on territories we, um, that were never intended to be ceded or transferred to the crown, for example, um, it's a recognition of the spirit and intent of existing treaties of shared stewardship, reciprocity, and mutual respect. Um, for example, the two wampum allowed settlers to occupy lands and established agreements that prom uh, promised to work in harmony and peace, um, which we have maintained for a long, long time while successor states, quote unquote, continue to extract, harm, erase, and promote the legal fiction of land ownership. Um, as a land trust, for example, at Nefolk, we recognize that and don't believe that land can ever be owned by any more than a human can be owned. Um, land trusts see themselves as forever and perpetuity, and we see this as a tool to reduce harm while um, working together to create the world free from extractive settler colonial pressures. So land back is to us not turning back the clock to an ancient imaginary, it's actually um, a return to things to us. It's a return to um, maintaining our knowledges and picking up our languages, um, maintaining the present tense in the ways of being, doing, and knowing instead of past tensifying indigenous presences on the land or in, um, in medicine knowledge or any of these other ways of being, doing, and knowing. Um, taking into account that we as Ongohoe will continue to evolve um, land back, of course, means access to our homelands again. Um, it means sustainable food and medicines grown on the land, and it means affordable housing in urban settings. Um, our indigenous languages come from the land, so land back, therefore, includes the return to our, of our languages to those lands. And speaking those languages on the land um, completes our understandings of our com cosmologies as indigenous peoples, our original instructions, and I would say land back also um, means a, a return to our traditional kinship systems and um, non-binary gender equity as well. So there's a lot of, it's, it's a fairly complex intersection of um, so many ways of, um, of being in right relationship with each other and with the land. Um, I'm just speaking to just bullet points here. We could go on for hours and hours about what this actually means, but. Thank you for asking. Well, thank you for sharing. Um, so now we've heard from each indigenous panelist what their definition of land back is to them. And 
Um, now I want to ask each Indigenous panelist how they accomplish those goals. How do you receive lands for stewardship, tenure, working with trusts, et cetera? Like, um, so Ramona, I know with the Native Land Conservancy and the Dennis Conservation Trust that you've signed agreements to allow access. Um, and one of them was the 250 coastal marsh acres of conservancy land um, with the Wampanoag tribal members. Um, and you have similar agreements in Barnstable and Sandwich, Mass. How did these relationships begin? Right, well, um, actually the idea of um, cultural respect agreements or cultural respect easements came from the Western tribes over in California. Um, we met with them at a conference uh, and they shared with us this model um, that they were using to access lands in California to uh, get resources for basket making and um, different types of materials. And so um, here in the East, um, there are a number of cultural materials that we would like to be able to use that no longer grow on our land so we thought about doing something similar. That's how it started. Uh, but since then, it's morphed into a number of things. Um, we have the cultural respect easements now. We call it easements. We tried to call it agreements, but that seemed to put people in this idea that we're having a contract with them, that that meant that we would have to give them something in return. And, we, and that was not really what the intention was. This was an opportunity for um, colonizers to give us <laughs> access as a group rather. And group access also, it speaks to the feeling of not being safe to go out alone. Every time, not every time, but when we go out on lands that are not ours per se, um, as they call it, the police are called, or the the, sh the wardens are called, um, or we're confronted by white people in general as to what we what we're doing there, and um, it's an attempt to protect our access. We we want it to be a formal document. It may be even a get out of jail card, but it is um, it was necessary to and also to teach people, uh, conservation groups, how unsafe we feel amongst white folks. Um, a lot of bad things have happened to our people in the woods, um, children as well. And I, we don't wanna play with that. Um, so that's one thing, access, um, access for foraging. We've been working with the state to include um, cultural, um, significance as one of the purposes for a conservation restriction. So if a tribe in Massachusetts um, can I, um, identify along with a property holder um, that there is something of cultural significance there, that a, a conservation restriction could be awarded or um, secured. So that, that 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 cultural significant area is protected for the benefit of the indigenous people, um, as well as the um, landowner can um, uh, be part of the protection for that. Um, yeah, so, so that's how we started. We have purchased land from um, tribal members who are, are in tax trouble. Um, on Cape Cod, the, um, although our territory for the Native Land Conservancy stretches far and wide into Mass southeastern Massachusetts and into Rhode Island, um, some of the areas where we, where we live, um, the, the, the taxes have risen so high that we're being taxed out of our own homelands. And so to protect some of those lands, uh, the NLC with donation money has purchased um, 
lots, wood lots, and other lots, uh, landlocked areas from uh, for tribal members so that they they won't lose it and they won't have unwelcome neighbors. Um, so that's that's another thing that we've been doing. Uh, there's a number of different relationships that have come out of um, other land trusts are offering um, conservation restrictions. We have um, protected an ancient village site um, it, uh, in Middleborough, and that, that's, uh, that's a working relationship with that town. And also the Archaeological Conservancy, which is a national organization. Um, these are strange, uh, uh, it's a strange relationship between indigenous and, and archaeologists, but um, we want to make sure that if they're going to dig in there, then we are going to be present to make sure that anything that is uncovered is, um, well, it's hard to, you know, we can't legally stop them, but we actually have on paper the rights to prevent any intrusion into uh, burials, especially mainly. Um, but they're not really after, they're not really trying to, to dig that area, they're trying to preserve it. Uh, so that was a good thing. And that, that is an important relationship to have. Um, Unlike, just like the land uh, acknowledgements, some organizations are making proclamations on how they feel about indigenous people having access. This is something that's new and coming up right now. Um, I have a sample of it. Um, I'll send it to you uh, as a handout um, and also a few other documents. I'll send them as handouts um, rather than sharing them on the screen, the text is really boring, but, but it's very interesting how um, different conservation groups are, are, are beginning to see the light and that um, acknowledging not just by saying, you know, hello to the tribes that used to be there or but they're actually talking about the tribes that are here and opening their doors to welcoming and protecting them while they're there on that land. So that those are some of the ways um, besides straight out donations, we have had donations of land from Yankees. And that's, um, I can't say it's hundreds of acres or anything like that, but it's a start. That's, it's a beautiful start. And thank you for talking about proclamations. I had never heard of that. Yeah. I've done a lot of research over this the last few weeks and I have not heard proclamations. So that's a new one. Thank yeah. you for sharing that. Um, Fred, glad to see you. We see you now. <laughs> yes, I'm, I'm back. I had uh, quite, a, quite a lot of technical difficulties here and uh, shut everything down and brought everything back up. So hopefully uh, I'm making sense here and I'm sorry I missed uh, the first part of the conversation, uh, but yes, go ahead. No worries, you're here now. I figured you dipped out to go sit in the sunshine today. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I know that there's been more than one instance of land back happening for the Nipmuc tribe. How did yes. these relationships begin? And how has the tribe benefited from or learned from these acts of kindness and generosity? Well, uh, uh, just in, in, in picking up on some relationships that had uh, started in the past, um, you know, one of the relationships uh, we had here was with the Chibungagungamug uh, folks in the Webster Dudley area. Uh, and they had made a connection with uh, a gentleman in uh, the Petersham area who wanted to uh, uh, work with us to uh, give some land uh, back. Um, so it was uh, basically uh, sitting down and, and talking with that person and uh, saying, well, here's what, you know, we're kind of interested in doing. Um, you know, you've expressed an interest also in, in helping us get there. How can we move this thing forward? 
So um, after a while, it took uh, several years to, uh, to sort of get to the point where land could be transferred. Uh, in one instance, uh, the land was uh, given outright. That was a smaller parcel of about two and a half acres, uh, which actually has some uh, very interesting features on it. Uh, it is across the road from a, uh, an ancient chamber, uh, which is uh, in, in the ground. Uh, and across the road where we own, uh, there are some different structures there that really need to be investigated. I think they go back quite a long way uh, prior to uh, colonial settlement, although it looks like there's definitely evidence of, of colonial activity on the site. Um, yeah, so it was uh, working with uh, that particular person. Uh, in another case, uh, we had someone who had been really a long friend of the tribe, uh, been involved in sort of doing their own research uh, for uh, in, in, in Native American uh, uh, studies, so to speak, uh, actually uh, was part of uh, a, a group that uh, put on a number of different presentations uh, on Native American culture. Uh, they uh, ended up uh, speaking with us and uh, saying that they wanted to transfer some land. And uh, I went and met with them, uh, talked to them about uh, how we could go about that. And uh, they recently made a uh, donation of uh, 48 acres uh, to uh, our organization. And there's a possibility we, should, we could be getting uh, more land as well, probably within the next year or two. So um it's just basically talking to people and becoming familiar and letting them become familiar with you um i think that really really helps uh there are those people out there that uh, are interested in in uh moving land over to uh native uh, <laughs> uh to the to our native folks uh and um just getting to know them uh is very very helpful Um, Question? <laughs> I'm sorry, I wasn't listening. <laughs> what did you say? There was a question? Oh, do I have a question? Yes. <laughs> I was like getting ready to <laughs> go ahead, because, uh, right, go ahead. I wanted to add on that. Uh, thank you, Fred, and thank you, everybody, for being here. It's um, um, really a thrill to be a part of this, and um, somebody who's moving quickly to elder status and I thinking thinking back when I was a kid and uh, thinking conversations like this could absolutely never take place and um, we're living really in a powerful time uh, in terms of what we're seeing this, this fundamental shift and in, um, in understanding and in the consciousness about the place we are how we attain knowledge what how do we value knowledge and and, and, and really understanding about what took place here on this land and um, and uh, interesting enough you know uh, we talk about capitalism and um, I've been calling it socialism capitalism because it's a redistribution of wealth within the same people, uh, generation after generation. Uh, and so we, we get lost in sometimes when we say capitalism, but there are a large group of, uh, of citizens are not taking part of it. Uh, right. uh, and so and so this is something that um, we really need to um, dismantle. And um, just driving up here, as I come, I see the sign. It says Deerfield established. And, uh, 1673 or whatever. And, and it's not really talking about the genocide, the war and all the different things that took place. And even uh, in uh, Webster Dudley area where I live, you see signs of still acknowledging, uh, they'll have signs of saying the, the Indians massacre, the Huguenots and things like that. And it's really not uh, uh, discussing the thousands of families and, and, and millions of and millions of uh, people who were displaced and, and, uh, uh, and, and essentially destroyed on that very land. And um, and uh, it's so excited to see what um what our Nipmunk people are doing today in the in terms of uh, um, land back. Um, and I want people to think about that the Nipmunk homeland was once two thousand square miles. Uh, um, and, and it's so grateful that we're getting making headway in, in Massachusetts. But there's still Rhode Island, there's still Connecticut, and there's Southern New Hampshire that still needs to acknowledge our right to exist. Uh, and, and so we're really um we're really thinking about that and. Um, and, uh, and it's so grateful to have allies supporting this because it's, it's really about dismantling those systems of power and they're really, they're interlocking, right? So when you unlock one, you're starting to see what, what, what was holding place in the other ones um, in terms of the land and, and different things like that um, for our people to uh, have that returned. And um, 
And what it means back to me is that um, we can't wait for the government, right? And that's Fred was talking about. It's no. building relationships uh, because essentially you're going to have citizens who are working to dismantle the things that the government in institutionalized, right? Whether it's yep. the emancipation, uh, reconstruction, Jim Crow, segregation. Th th these were individuals that had to change this, you know? And so if you think you can't do anything, you're, you know, waiting on the government to help the Indians, it's, it's going to be you. It's going to be citizens to stand up and work and, and really uh, recognize this need. So again, I want to uh, thank everybody as we go forward. So appreciate that. Thank you. I, I was I was distracted because uh, Larry was like waving at me, and you you said something about a question, Fred. I was like, oh no! <laughs> well, I, so I saw sorry. him going. I saw him going going pretty good over there. So <laughs> <laughs> I am I am listening to you. So don't don't think I'm not listening. <laughs> um, Kristen. How have you worked with landowners to allow access for your, your community, um, the remediation project, uh, to learn about gardening, traditional medicines, harvesting? Like, what works for you? How does that How does that work? Yeah, I would say, um, well, we're always walking this fine line between the urgency, um, like as Ramona was sharing too, which is, we, we don't have a lot of answers, but we know that we can lead the path and the way out and, and we should be. Um, and at the same time, some of the things that Stephanie spoke to and just unraveling and relearning and healing for our people in all of the years of trauma. Um, it's not easy, you know, I, I was just saying the other day how I haven't done any reading just for pleasure. Like all of my reading is about my ancestors to make sure that I know what's out there. And it can be, you know, everything from the petitions which are heartbreaking to have those name ties from my genealogy and just I can name an ancestor and and do a search and usually it's some sort of grievance or petition around either a lack of access to their traditional fishing um, the criminalization of of our people um, through the years of indentured servitude there were a lot of my family members the Natick that um, had very erroneous tax debts medical liens um, uh, you know, getting in trouble for something and being jailed and needing to sell land to pay that out. And, and we had guardians that were kind of gatekeepers. They were appointed by the Commonwealth and um, would even stand to profit off of our, um, our land sales and our deals and all of these erroneous liens. Um, so it's been a really, you know, there's kind of this slow pace of um, sort of digesting this and knowing we're in this for the long haul. My daughters know. <laughs> Um, you know, my, my oldest keeps saying, but mom, I just want to be a nutritionist. And I'm like, well, that is inherently NIPMA. And you can be that and still fight for the health and well-being of our people. Um, so there's this path and trajectory of, of health, um, the fight for the health and well-being, which I feel the collective is really great for responding for the times that we do get these acres of land into our hands and relearning our medicines and relearning our fishing and relearning our languages and our songs and knowing what to do and how to be a good steward when these opportunities arrive. Um, we're also very political. And so through that is this process of political education within our tribal communities of knowing you know, our existence is political and, um, and that we're not just born having these inherent rights, that these are struggles of our ancestors. And so what does that mean when we're stepping into um, benefit off of something that our ancestors struggled for a really long time to make sure that we could have access to? Um, and then there's the other dynamic of working within the colonial structures. Um, personally, I, I was involved with, the, I still am involved with the Boston Harbor Islands National Park my um, ancestors were forcefully removed in um, the middle of the night in October 1675 and left out on Deer Island through the winter. Um, and so we've been trying to get land back in that sense of just even having a seat at the table and being respected as original stewards um, of, of the rivers that led into these systems of, of utilizing these landscapes beyond just being captive um, and beyond the kind of the tragic stories of our circumstances. And so there's been years and years, that's been a couple of decades. And I would say that we still do not have that, um, 
that respected standing within the National Park Service structure. So we're working with um, public landowners and this sort of access and respect for decision making, and then everything down to private landowners um, who will just give space for growing, for um, seed sovereignty, for reclaiming our traditional seeds. Uh, you know, we work with people who will propagate, uh, you know, some of our traditional medicines that we can't access because they're in private property or because they're in polluted waterways, trying to rematriate them to landscapes. Like, again, I'm just so excited what Brett is doing too. And we know that we have, um, I mean, that's, that's the interconnectedness, I think, in the way that this can work. We're all born into a gift, and I believe that's what Eastern Wilderness Rematriation is really trying to lean into of where is our place within the community to support this kind of scaling out of indigenous sovereignty in the landscape. Um, so that's really where we focus. And we have private landowners that give over infrastructure or the sharing of in infrastructure. We needed to process like a ton of beans from a CSA share, um, farm that gave over a plot of land. Um, this past growing season. And with the pandemic, we were thinking of all storage crops and vegetables and things like that, mostly three sisters that could then provide some sort of food security. But there was also this re reestablishing that relationship by bringing our children to that, that land and just giving them the opportunity to just be who they are in those spaces is the way of awakening because we understand our land has memory and, and that is, you know, Peter spoke to it a little bit. It's almost like the reconciliation piece. It's not just the human aspect of it. Our traditional landscapes are highly contextualized. Like Larry was saying, these are about families who faced a lot of tear and bloodshed and trauma in these spaces. And the land bear witness to all of that. The land holds that pain and that memory. And so we all stand to gain something um, by just establishing that reconnection. And like one other example I can share is um, just recently there's a large farm in, um, in central Massachusetts that just that just voted, I think, you know, through this relationship with Nimuk people and listening to what they have to say, not rushing for an answer, not rushing for some quick transactional um, activity that could make them feel good about doing the right thing but literally just approved a proposal of like, we're gonna give over our infrastructure and we're gonna like in two year increments, revisit this relationship. And for now we're giving you this space. And so we were able to bring our kids out and, and harvest some, some bark that we needed and, and, tap, and tap maple trees and drink that sap and like literally just have that relationship kindled is, is healing and process. So I guess, you know, there's a variety of ways that we're doing it and, and challenges we face in terms of very colonial structures and dominance, like some of these public lands that still have a really hard time validating indigenous knowledge and ways of being, and also private landowners that are just saying, you know what, I'm not doing this to be a hero. I'm really gonna open this up in terms of the pace that you want. Um, and then we have everything in between from like, farm holders that are worried about all of the assets that they've put into their property and what does that look like to give over that power. Um, we're grappling with all of that. And, um, and I think this, this is a really great panel to kind of show that variation of, of what we're up against and, and the role that everybody in the room can play. Thank you for sharing, Kristen. That's so beautiful. And you're so right, land has memory, land remembers the language, remembers the songs, and remembers you when you're out on it. Um, that is so beautiful. And I am drinking maple sap because our, our trees are running. <laughs> um, Stephanie, I would like to know about the relationships of indigenous land tenure, land stewardship in the Northeast Farmers of Color Land Trust. Like how are you able to partner and gain access to land for your community and your work? Great question. Um, okay, so Northeast Farmers of Color Land Trust is a little bit of a misnomer as far as what we are and who we are and what we do and why we do it, but um, it's the name that we were given when we inherited this work. So um, what we are, because we're not just farmers, obviously, and we actually look at agrarianism as um, a little bit extractive on, on the whole. So. <laughs> um, 
So to start, uh, the Northeast Farmers of Color Land Trust is um, Indigenous driven. We have um, Indigenous, our, our co-directors too, out of the three are Indigenous people. Um, we have Neatmuk folks on the board, which is a really lovely gift. And we are building wonderful partnerships with um, many Indigenous nations just at the very beginning of building partnerships with um, many Indigenous nations across uh, what is now known as the Northeast part of the US. Um, we always, we say this now because um, we are a land trust without land <laughs> because we are building trust. And I think that's most important to say is that we're not um, coming in and just acquiring land um, and replicating settler colonial harm on the land by trading land as something that you can just transact on without um, respecting the histories, the living histories of these lands and the relationships that, living relationships that are currently, um, currently held right now. So just to be clear about that, um, we are a multicultural, 100% Black Indigenous POC driven land trust. And we are uh, collectively weaving together our global Indigenous ways of being, doing and knowing on the land, including um, really with beginning with relationships. So my role is I'm the executive director, but I'm also the relationships resources and reciprocity co-director of the land trust, because we really need to focus on building not just consultation with Indigenous nations, but true partnerships to start with that relationship. I'm also a co-investigator on something called the Relational Accountability for Indigenous Rematriation Project out of um, York University. And um, again, it's really acknowledging that we need to start with relationship and account accountability, not only between settlers and non-Indigenous settlers, but also between Indigenous nations as well as those indigenous peoples who were stolen from their homelands and forced into enslavement here on Turtle Island. So really beginning with um, building black indigenous solidarity is a really strong, strong piece of the work for us. Um, acknowledging that the descendants of formerly enslaved peoples were not brought here of their own accord and um, were forced to work here um, and be enslaved here without their consent, obviously. So knowing that there are a lot of interconnected and complex ties between our communities and um, between our peoples and that we all need to survive and thrive on these lands. Um, but we, that we respect that these are the original homelands of the original peoples of this area. Um, we include recognition of territories and eco regions versus state and national boundaries. Um, we definitely work on telling the truth about the homelands that we are on. So historical signage is a big one, especially in New England, where historical signage is deeply violent um, and tells stories that are that re traumatize our people every single time they drive past one. Um, we actually have a sort of a little green book that we're building of um, safe spaces and also places that need to change these signs and take them down. <clears throat> um, so um, part of that is returning not only the languages of the land, but also speaking those languages and renaming places based on the traditional territories and peoples of these lands. We advocate for that. Um, we also are facilitating and examining the um, structures and mechanisms for rematriation of land um, with the NDN Collective, who's a partner, as well as many other collectives who are working with, um, just to start really thinking about rematriation. Um, we are doing something and supporting something called biocultural restoration. And for the next five plus years, my life will be completely um, en engulfed in this work, I guess, of restoration, not just restoration, but also making story on the land, new story with our indigenous relatives, with our communities. Um, I'm starting a PhD program with the Center for Native Peoples and the Environment starting in the fall that will be focusing on that um, full time. So that will again be building relationship um, through resituating indigenous land stewardship and land management practices on the land and then measuring those by, um, by storytelling and story making. We're also um, learned from Ramona and um, our friend Peter Forbes here about the wonderful um, stop gap measure known as the cultural respect easement, which is something that we had Ramona on for a webinar. Um, just to discuss how that was going in your territory. And that was a really wonderful tool to learn about that many people are really excited about that kind of transcends the idea of um, those 
no trespassing signs that myself and a lot of the medicine folks who I work with have been forced off of land at gunpoint or um, with threat of physical violence because of those no trespassing signs. Um, so advocating for those as well as advocating for voluntary taxation on land as a harm reduction mechanism and as a, um, a temporary way to reposition communal wealth. Um, and then also just helping with um, advocating for meaningful land acknowledgements that include actionable ways that organizations are actually supporting indigenous land sovereignty. So not just for the optics of saying we're on territory um, and we recognize that we're here, but okay, that's a good step, but now you need to move into some action. So, th so there's a, those are just some basic ways um, that we as a land trust are starting to work. We facilitate rematriation with and for indigenous nations. So anytime land comes to us, the first thing we do is contact the um, leadership in those territories to find out how can we facilitate rematriating this land back to your people. Thanks. Thank you so much for sharing, Stephanie. And you brought up historical signage. Wow, that might be our next panel because where we live, the signage here is off the charts. Um, I mean, <clears throat> we really need to address how indigenous people are represented through plaques, memorials, um, statues. Um, we are on the Mohawk Trail. Um, yeah, we really need to address that. That's, that's super important. Thank you for bringing that up. You're <laughs> you probably, you put the seed in for the next one. Um, so now for our non-Indigenous panelists, I want to thank you so much for being patient. And I know that you both understand the importance of lifting Indigenous voices first and foremost, especially when it's by and for Indigenous people. So Jessica, can you tell us uh, your experiences of the wonderful things that can happen through this kind of work with Indigenous communities and talking about creating those intersectional relationships and offer examples of these kinds of efforts? Maybe you okay, can have some notes. <laughs> I actually even said, are you sure you want me to be on this panel? <laughs> it's true, and I had to convince her. <laughs> I was like, I don't need to be on this panel. Um, so I've had um, the wonderful opportunities to work on a bunch of different land bank projects. Um, the first, very first one that I worked on as a PhD student back in 2007 was with the Cree Nation of Wenninji. Um, and they had, uh, built a team with the McGill University and Concordia University to establish a biocultural marine and terrestrial protected area. It's a whole mouthful there. Um, but basically they wanted to protect an area of their homeland um, from uh, extractive industries, specifically gold mining, and also create a place that the colonial governments, that would be the provincial and the federal governments, would not touch. And it would be a place that uh, for conservation, but also for um, indigenous learning, for living on the land and hunting and fishing and uh, doing winter walks and their annual paddle. Um, so that's one that I worked on. And then the next one that I learned from and worked on was uh, um, out in Ontario, um, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy Chiefs Council was um, in a joint stewardship agreement with the municipal city of Hamilton, Municipal Council of Hamilton, Ontario. And they entered into an agreement um, to implement Haudenosaunee governance to restore the Red Hill Valley there. And I wanna give this example, the like, first example is like an indigenous conserved and protected area. The second example is um, an example of a colonial entity government, in this case, a city council, um, working on a nation to nation basis with an indigenous traditional government um, to implement their, their principles and their indigenous governance and also their decision making processes. So the timing of, of their decision making and not rushing it based on the colonial um, model. So this is very nerdy stuff. Um, let me see a few more examples here. Uh, I, I wanted to give some examples. I, I took down notes of examples, but you really heard a lot of examples from the panelists already. Um, 
Is this where I should talk about how um, non-Indigenous people can educate ourselves a bit? Okay, so I think like one of the, <laughs> I think that one of the, um, the key things for um, non-Indigenous folks who are interested in being potential allies in Land Back is to undertake a um, path of, of learning of, um, and there's, I brought, so many books, like I'm an uber nerd here, but I brought these books as an example of the kinds of um, reading that we non-Indigenous people can do. Um, but first I wanted to say that, um, um, okay, so some of the examples are, um, there's really wonderful Indigenous scholarship on Indigenous law and governance. Um, traditional governance is often based on kinship. Um, and there's many wonderful scholars who are um, writing about and speaking about and generating how traditional governance carries for, forward into the present and the future. So like, for example, John Burroughs, he's an Anishinaabeg scholar, and he is a prolific writer. He puts out tons of books about um, ind Indigenous law and legal frameworks and values and ethics and how they apply to now. Um, also important, I would say, is a general education um, to read uh, sort of general Native studies um, books. I would recommend Arthur Manuel. I know he writes about Canada, but he's an amazing, wonderful, or he was, he just passed in 2017, wonderful, accessible scholar to try and um, unsettle, to use his word, our colonial assumptions that we have when, when we are starting to try to learn about indigenous histories and presence and futures. Um, another wonderful general um, education book is this one by Thomas King. He's a Cherokee scholar and he has a, um, an amazing knack of humor. Like he will, he will make you laugh and cry. Um, I have a whole bunch here that people can look at afterwards, but I'd say it's also important in, in this area where we are to, to read history. Um, and so a lot of people know about like, for example, the common pot, Lisa Brooks's book about indigenous history in this area. Um, but you can also read this by William Apis. He wrote, he, wrote um, he published and wrote a long time ago. So it's important to read um, books written by indigenous people here. But even perhaps most importantly to read some contemporary um, contemporary books like these ones by Larry, <laughs> but in books about indigenous cultures and life ways that are from indigenous perspectives. I love Larry's books. I'm just reading this one um, because you can hear, hear the oral tradition in his voice and, and how he's a storyteller. Um, but also here's this one by Paula Peters. That's about Wampanoag. And um, I would also say it's important to ask the question, um, if possible, what are the creation stories on the land that we're living? Um, and this is an example of a book. He's, he's from Canada, um, Isaac Murdoch, but Isaac Murdoch um, published some Algonquian creation stories in a book. So you can read in that way. So that's, that's just the reading, but other ways of learning about creation stories and about indigenous relationships with land and people here are by attending public events and listening to people like this. Um, so yeah, I'd say that's good. Now, the other thing that I really wanted to say is that as it, from a, like a settler colonial perspective, it's really important for us to um, suspend our perspectives of American exceptionalism and absolutism. And what do I mean by that? What I mean is that we tend to think, well, first of all, we have in our, our uh, legal system the statement that we hold these truths to be self-evident. And now it seems that people are waking up that they are not truths and they're not self-evident. So what we have to do is we have to suspend our assumptions about American law coming from God. American law, American values, American culture was invented by men um, and some women too. Um, and in order to learn really well from indigenous teachers and scholars and community leaders, we have to just kind of, we have to start by throwing out what we thought that we knew. Um, 
and to also understand that this these laws american laws are relatively young um they're very very recent and um they can and they they must change in order to adapt to the realities of the populations now and in the future um and i loved hearing um what ramona had to say about um not so fast with just everyone rushing to ask indigenous people about the solutions to climate change. I think that um, non-indigenous people, we need to be very humble about our, our learning and have good boundaries about it. And um, it, it's important to be an authentic relationship and um, we're gonna make mistakes. Um, so it's important for us as in any, any uh, relationship to understand that we're going to make mistakes, but to stick with it. Um, should I talk about cape and pedestal? I feel like I've gone on for a little while. <laughs> do how, much time? how much time do we have? We have like about 10 minutes or so. And I, okay. I, I want to hear from Peter. Okay, okay. So, so I think that's good enough for now. But um, if you have any um, questions about my um, very opinionated experiences about this, then please feel free to ask me afterwards. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I do like the idea of your cave and pedestal because we had talked about this before and that's a and really pedestal. important uh, aspect <laughs> but Peter you've had tremendous uh, success building relationships between conservations land trusts and the indigenous tribes in Maine and I feel like and we had talked about this I feel like in a way you have found a key like um, can you talk about how the policies um, and protecting spaces are in effect sort of closing this door to access and what is the key to opening this door like what is your relationship building strategy and you know how does this work yeah <laughs> such an important question um i guess i would say uh the, the key is is knowing history things that have already been said and and humility i mean i'm very very much aware particularly right in this moment the magnitude of this whole question i'm i'm still shaking a little bit you know from hearing ramona uh tell that powerful story of of the person who said to her don't do it pull the hand back and she used the term betrayal and i too am aware i'm deeply aware i am from the very uh colonial structures that have perpetuated these problems right <laughs> so i'm aware of the the betrayals i have very dear Wabanaki colleagues who I respect deeply who have said to me, Peter, this is too little, too late. So I, I carry all of that. Uh, and it makes me more determined and, and more humble. Um, and if I might, I, I want to speak directly uh, to the non-Indigenous people that are listening to this live stream. I, I want to I want to say some things to them because I know all of the indigenous panelists or others who aren't will know what I'm I'm going to say. Can I just share? I want to show a map, a, a couple of things. Let me. Would it be all right for me to do that? Absolutely. Yeah. Here we go. Um, I think you're able to see this, folks. This is this is a map, 1776 of indigenous stewardship of the land. And this is a map of the loss of that. I want you to take that in one more time. Look at where it starts, look at where it ends, look at the flow of it. And this, um, this is a map of, of conservation ownership in our country. And uh, one of the key things, I, I think of what Larry said, we can't wait wait for the government. I, I believe that's so true. I, I, the community I'm from, the conservation community, we, we don't have the power to change treaties, but we have that power. We have the power that you see on that map. And if we have the will, if we have the awareness and the ability, we can achieve enormous reconciliation, just as evidenced on that map. Um, I want to just shoot ahead to, to talk about um, these are the kinds of questions that, that to make those transitions, the movement that I am from has to ask ourselves, who are insiders and outsiders to us? And how does our history, you know, the, what, what, uh, what Kristen said about the, the history of uh, Boston 
Harbor Islands National Park. I mean, that history of forcible removal of black, brown, and indigenous people to create our national parks, that is, that is part of the story. The, that if you look like me, it is the hidden story to the conservation movement that has to be understood in order for us to really achieve any kind of promise in our, in our work. Because without that, this, this is the, the end result, the protecting um, from people and, and away. Um, all of this uh, became real for me in the land that initiated me into my life, and that is in Maine. Um, where the Wabanaki have been reduced to less than 1% of their land ownership. And we don't have the time right now for me to tell you how I came to these understandings or, or where the relationships began. But just focus in on that fact that our, our Wabanaki communities, of which there are five, um, op, maintain their culture on less than 1% of the land um, that they once stewarded. And, and over that same period of time, conservationists have come to control 23% of the state. I mean, shouldn't there be an opportunity there just within that alone for some reconciliation? That's the question that we've been wrestling with. And yes, there is. Um, and, and that land that, that is the second homes of people who look like me and the nature preserves was a Wabanaki breadbasket and, and home grounds. And so this is the transition that we are trying to make from land conservation to land justice. And in Maine, we call it first light. And, it, and the ideas there are to repair and return at the speed of trust. And it, it turns out that the speed of trust, it, it's slow in the beginning for sure. I mean, we've been at it for almost four years now, but you'll see in a moment that that going slow and, and relearning history, doing these three things, relearning exactly what was talked about before, recentering indigenous voice, then returning, that those are the, key, those are the keys that you were talking about, Rhonda. And relearning, it, it's definitely about history, but every year a cohort of conservation groups, first there were seven, then there were 15, and now there are 65 conservation organizations who spend 18 days every year going to the uh, reservations, doing homestays, meeting with the chiefs, reading the treaties, um, going on canoe expeditions, hearing from the elders, hearing from the next generation, really understanding that different worldview so that we can then go to this, which is about recentering. Um, in the very first gathering, Native, non-native that we had in 2019, or we met separately, native, non-native came back together. Mona was there, uh, Stephanie was there. You will remember uh, when Darren Ranko and John Banks Penobscot at the end turned to us and said, we need the opportunity to have these forums to keep building our voice among the tribe. And so we set out to do that. You know, we've, we, we've raised $150,000 every year and we'll keep doing it to build the first pan-tribal Wabanaki uh, place of dialogue so that they can give the white conservation movement direction on what they need. That's centering indigenous voice in my opinion. And that's been a, if you can imagine <laughs> what a challenge it's been to do all of that. But in our humble way, we are making progress with that. The, the Wabanaki Commission on Land and Stewardship has, has been seated, um, appointed by the five tribal communities, and it is now meeting regularly to give us direction on the lands it needs. Ramona and Steph, you'll remember this gathering, this, this moment. And what that has led to is returning. And returning looks, it takes many different shapes. It is centering indigenous voice, but in those three years, we've already granted legal access to 62,000 acres for harvesting of medicines, holding of ceremony, protecting ancestors. We've also rematriated 2,200 acres in fee simple to individual tribes. We, we think that the Wabanaki Commission will become 
a Wabanaki land trust in time. But we're standing by as a movement, as a conservation movement in service to these tribes and this commission. We're training and giving introductions to them, to our funders. And, and most important of all, we're supporting the co-management of significant public landscapes. I think in Maine, we will be co-managing national parks before any other place in the United States because of these three things, relearning, recentering, and returning. And I hope that from the place of colonization, that, there, it, that this gives all of you on this call, this, this meeting, this convocation, the hope of what's possible to transform something. And I'll pause with that. Thank you so much, Peter, for sharing. You've really sort of crystallized what we've all been talking about here. Um, and I know that several panelists have also brought up um, the treaties. Uh, the United States alone has entered over 500 treaties, all of which have been broken. And I just want you to think about what this landscape, what tribal nations would look like today if none of those treaties were broken. Just really think about that for a moment. Um, I want to reiterate what we've heard today that we need to learn about indigenous peoples from your area, learn about their past and present struggles. Ask them what their wishes are moving forward with land back, listening and creating ways to relationship build and find out what form of land back works best. Is it individual, tribal? Is it just access, tenure, stewardship? Um, what is it? Is it just funding? Um, so in closing, um, I want to leave us with words that I have read from Ramona and quote her, if that's okay. Our mother earth feeds us in every way. She can restore us to our natural state of being when we find ourselves disconnected from what we think of as real. So when we leave this space, um, really think about that and the space that you're in and how and what your connection is and what that connection is, what that remembrance is of this land is. So thank you so much to the panelists for being here on such a gorgeous day. Go out there and enjoy your sun while you have it. <laughs> I just have thank one you. other thing to say, one more thing. Yes. <laughs> Uh, there's a book that folks might be interested in. It's called The Dispossession by Degrees, uh, Indian Land and Identity in Natick, Massachusetts, 1650 to 1790 by Jean M. O'Brien. So it might be something you might want to look up and uh, get a copy of it. Uh, it'll explain a lot. <laughs> so. Oh, thank, thank you. you so much. Is there is there any other comments from the panelists? I mean, we've we're running out of time, so that's why I just ended without any questions or comments. So I feel really bad about that. Yeah, is I just want to say it was really a pleasure to see everyone and listen. I've learned a lot, and I've certainly enjoyed this conversation. A very important one. Thank you. Thanks, Ramona. Thank you so thank much, you. everybody, for the invitation. Um, it was so wonderful to be. Um, virtually with everybody. And it was great to see some wonderful familiar faces again. And thanks so much for all of your wonderful work. Thank you for sharing. Appreciation to you all. Um, obviously with a beautiful day, it means we're all very committed to doing this work. We're all showing up in this space and for those who are paying attention through live stream. So just wishing you all well um, and on this on this journey of, of of unlearning and relearning and um, remembering and um, and of justice, right? Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Jess. Thank you. Thank you to Double Edge and everyone that's here today. I appreciate you for listening. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.